Here to introduce uh, tonight's speaker is, is co-organizer of this, tonight's event, Esther Garcia. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks so much for coming this evening. Um, uh, good evening, my name is Esther Garcia, and I'm a librarian here at the Pecan Campus uh, South Texas College Library. Along with Ms. Gina Otvos over by the entrance, we are so proud to have collaborated with uh, the Center for Mexican American Studies, uh, headed by Victor Gomez. Today, Dr. Zamora will be discussing the World War I Diary of Jose de la Luz Sainz, published originally in Spanish in 1933. It's the only World War I diary ever published by a Mexican American. His diary entries and letters recount not only his own war experiences, but also those of Mexican Americans. Now, right now, I'm so proud to introduce Dr. Emilio Zamora. He has, Dr. Zamora has roots in the Mexico-Texas border, this, <laughs> exactly where we're standing, this Mexico-Texas border, where we are, uh, re dating back to the 1700s. He grew up on both sides of the international line. Dr. Zamora has authored four books. He has co-edited three anthologies and assisted in the production of a Texas history text textbook. He has received six book awards, including the Texas, it's, uh, from the Texas State Historical Association, the Texas Philosophy Society, the Texas Institute of Letters, the Tejano Geneal Genealogy Society of Austin, the Texas Historical Commission, and the Southern Historical Association. He has received a Best Article Prize from the Western History Association and a Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellowship. Dr. Zamora is a lifetime member of the Texas Institute of Letters, a lifetime fellow with the Texas State Historical Association, and he is a current fellow with of, of the Barbara White Stewart Centennial Professorship in Texas History at the University of Texas and a fellow with the Institute of His Historical Studies. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Emilio Zamora. Thank you, <coughs> Victor and Esther, and everybody else involved in having me here. Uh, I have a number of things to say about Jose de Luz Sainz. I'm here basically to introduce you to this extraordinary historical figure, and uh, of course, primarily in honor of our veterans who we acknowledge today, this very important day. He is um, probably the only Mexican-American to ever uh, have published a, a war diary of, in any war. Uh, keep in mind that writing memoirs after the fact is different than writing a diary while you're being shot at, all right? He, he served 16 months in the 90th Division, uh, 360th Infantry. Uh, he served in France and returned safely and then put his book together. But let me start by saying, giving you some biographical information about him. He was born in Realitos, Texas, <coughs> south of San Diego, Texas. His family comes from Mier and Camargo on the border. They migrated two generations prior to his birth to uh, uh, Realitos, where he was born. Uh, he wasn't getting much of an education in this little ranch. And so they, the parents moved the family to Alice, Texas. There he, he graduated at the top of his class, one of the top students in the official school. Most schools either segregated children or they excluded them entirely, Mexican-American children. Some schools did ride by Mexican-American children. Alice High School did. So he graduated from Alice High School, but he also attended an independent Mexican school. We call them escuelitas. Mexican-Americans formed their own schools, either because their kids were not being treated well or excluded, or because they wanted their children to, to hear about Mexico, to hear about Mexican-American culture and Spanish and so forth. So they wanted to supplement things. Uh, he graduated a perfect bilingual. Uh, and soon after graduation, he and 
some other young people in Alice, Texas, hosted an, a, a public program, an event commemorating the birth of Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez <clears throat> is a native indigenous person from Mexico who achieved great things in Mexico. Among these things are the following. He became the head of the Supreme Court in Mexico and then the president of Mexico. And then lastly, he also led the country in defending it after when the, when the French invaded Mexico and occupied it. And so he led this liberation movement. But he admired, Jose La Luz at, uh, Sainz admired Juarez because he was an indigenous person. Jose La Luz Sainz considered himself an indigenous person. Uh, publicly, he was a Mexican American. He called himself a Latin American too. But privately, uh, in intimate circles, he was an indigenous person. When people <clears throat> outside of Alice, Texas heard about this great celebration of uh, President Juarez, they asked him if he could come and teach their children during the day and the adults at night, and he agreed. And that's how he started a 40-year, at least 40-year career as a teacher. He taught throughout the state of Texas. He started teaching outside of Alice, Texas in a place called El Palo del Oso, and then he moved towards central Texas, south of San Antonio. He taught in San Agustin, outside of Pleasanton. He taught in Ditlinger, a little Mexican town next to New Braunfels, and many other places, Moore, Texas. And his family members <coughs> claimed that he moved a lot because everywhere he went, he found problems. Mexican children are, be, are being separated to separate facilities that were very unequal. And oftentimes, the school districts offered uh, children, Mexican children, uh, education only up to the fourth grade. So he was always protesting that. He was a Mexican teacher in a segregated Mexican school, and he was always protesting that, so he would lose his job. So he'd go to another place and start teaching all along writing a lot and speaking about the educational rights of Mexican American children. Uh, over the years, he taught in various schools, segregated in official schools, was the principal of some schools, and made that grand circle and came back and was teaching uh, at the very end in McAllen, Texas. So he started in Relitos, came back. South Texas. <clears throat> what else can I say about his biography? Well, um, soon after the war began in France, it begins in 1914, we enter in 1917. In 1917, President Wilson announced that people, young men, should register for, for a lottery for the draft. He registered. And he served for 16 months. He was training in, in, um, in San Antonio. And then he was shipped across the ocean to England, across the channel, into France, to southern France for further training. And then he participated with the 90th Division, the 360th Infantry, in two major offensives. This is a horrible war, by the way. And one of the things that he does is, of course, he witnesses the horrors of the war. He also witnesses the bravery uh, of soldiers, including Mexican-American soldiers. And he was struck by that. Every day, he wrote something down in whatever piece of paper he could get his hands on. He, people, the soldiers knew that he wanted to write so they would give him little pamphlets or little publications and he would write on the margins and wherever there was an empty space. He also wrote letters to his loved ones. And he also was a war correspondent for the La Prensa, a daily from San Antonio. So when he comes back from the war in 1919, he puts all these materials together. He begins to collate them. Okay? And then he publishes a book in 1933. So from 1919, to 1933, he's busy doing this. <clears throat> I asked myself, why does it take so long, 15 years, to put these notes together? Well, he's 
He's the head of a household. In fact, when he joined the military, he was already married and had children. He didn't have to serve, by the way, but he volunteered. Uh, <clears throat> so he puts, he, so he's heading a family, but he's also doing something else which is very, very important. He's involved uh, in public life. He's a leader in the Mexican-American community. He continues what he was doing before the war, writing and speaking about the rights of young people in the public schools. But then he broadens his uh, arguments for equal rights for, for workers, Mexican-American workers, and so forth and so on. He joins up with two other really stellar individuals, more than two, but the two principal ones were Alonso Perales and Jose Tomas Canales. Alonso Perales is um, from Alice, Texas, served in the military, became an attorney, and became one of the most important major civil rights leader in the country. Jose Tomas Canales was an attorney from Brownsville, Texas. He became a state legislator and did a number of other things, published books and so forth. Perales, Canales, and Sainz got together. In 1926 and 27, they went on a speaking tour. And they came to the South. <coughs> they spoke about problems confronting the Mexican-American community, segregation, discrimination, social inequality, and the responsibility that Mexican-Americans had to be actively involved in resolving those problems. So they called for a, a conference in Harlingen, Texas in 1927 to form a statewide organization to, to harness all the leadership strength in the community. <clears throat> the, the meeting failed in producing the statewide organization because of a major division between the U.S. born and the Mexico born. And Perales, Canales, and Sainz were accused of parting ways with the immigrants. And they were saying, no, we're not trying to part ways with the immigrants. What we want to do is use our constitutional rights as U.S. citizens. We can no longer just argue on, on a moral basis that they should treat us equally. We are now citizens. Of course, the Constitution guarantees equal rights to everybody regardless of citizenship. But he was saying, we now have reached a point where we have large numbers of citizens, some of whom are well-educated, well-placed, with good jobs, can sustain an organization. We need to make constitutional arguments. They tried again in Corpus Christi in 1929. And out of that meeting was born the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. So Perales, Canales, and Sainz are three of the principal co-founders of the longest running civil rights organization speaking on behalf of Mexican Americans in the United States. <coughs> That's Jose Lalu Sainz. Now, <coughs> I had some notes. When I, how did I find out about um, his diary. His diary is what I want to talk about. Hmm. Uh, years ago, I was teaching a, a class on Mexican-American history, and I was at that point of the 1920s and 1930s where I shared with my students what I just shared with you and much more. And I mentioned him. And a young woman came to me after class and said, thank you for talking about my granduncle. I says, ooh, <laughs> this is science. Science is my granduncle. And by the way, do you know that he wrote a book. I said, I, I know he put together a book, but I've never seen it. We said, well, I have a copy. Very few copies were printed because you didn't have the means to publish large numbers of copies, and universities didn't have the interest in collecting the materials. So the books remained in, pub in private hands. Okay, That's one of the reasons why historians who were writing Texas history, book after book, article after article throughout the 20th century never even mentioned him. Go check your Texas history books and you'll see. He's nowhere to be mentioned. Not even Canales, not even Perales. It's now recently that people have begun to take notice of them. So I decided I need to incorporate the diary. So I read the diary over and over again. It's just an extraordinary publication. It's one of the most extraordinary publications that's ever come out of the Mexican-American community, including the publications that have been published in recent, recent times by academic historians. 
<clears throat> this is extraordinary. I'll talk about why I think it's extraordinary in a minute. So I decided I'm going to incorporate the diary I did, but I, decide, I, des I decided I shouldn't translate it because, you know, that takes a lot of time. It really is a lot of work. And frankly, in my profession, I get little credit for translations. Okay, it, you know, a book is a book you, you alter by yourself. And you get credit for that, and that's how you get promoted. <coughs> credit, articles count less. Uh, translated works count somewhere in the, in, in the middle. So I said, you know, I, got to, I need to write the books and the articles. Years passed and nobody published it. Nobody translated and published a translation. So I decided to translate and edit the book. And I'll tell you a sensation that I've, or a feeling that I got <clears throat> that once I was uh, uh, swimming across the river, I got to the middle of the river and I was really exhausted. And I got I kind of freaked out a little bit. And I said, I better swim back. And I realized, well, I, it's the same distance forward. So I just went ahead and continued swimming and reached the other bank. That's how I felt about the translation. Uh, I regretted it, really, when I got to the middle of it. It's very difficult to translate meaning. You want to be true. You want to be respectful of the writer. You want to say what you think he did say. But there's moments when there's contradictory meanings and so forth. But anyway, I did it. And, uh, and so I'm very happy to say that it is now available in English so that people now don't have the excuse that it was once in Spanish and not readily available because of limited copies. Now it is, it is available, so by an impress, and it's in English, and it's fully edited. Every event and individual and place is identified with footnotes. Now, let me get to the diary. <laughs> and, and this is, uh, of course, the English version. I have a, 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 an image of the original that I'll show you in a minute. <coughs> uh, the diary does what diaries do. They give you a day-to-day -day account of things that the writer observes. So this is an account of the war experiences in World War I. He talks about all the uh, soldiers, but he focuses on Mexican-Americans. So it's, it's a valuable record of the wartime experiences of soldiers, particularly Mexican-American soldiers. That's from the start, what is most extraordinary about it. To be able to, <clears throat> to give a, a reliable account on a daily basis for 16 months while you're being shot at, rats eating the gore left from the, sh the torn bodies of your buddies, being shot at by um, cannon, uh, machine gun fire, and so forth. He was persistent, and he did it. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is very important about him, about the diary, is that he gives us uh, a running argument about why it's necessary for Mexican Americans to be in the military and to make the ultimate sacrifice in the battlefield. That's a lot. Okay. During the First World War, some Mexicans avoided the draft by fleeing to Mexico. They became slackers. Others, we don't know the exact numbers, others, like signs, chose to serve. And he said, I don't blame them for fleeing. You know, they've never felt that they've been treated like they're part of this country. Why should they serve this country? They should treat us so that we do feel like we're from here. Once we feel that we're from here, then we'll act like we're from here. So he defended them. But then he said, we have to serve, and not only serve, <clears throat> but make the ultimate sacrifice so that future generations can point to our contributions and use our sacrifice to call for equal rights in future generations. So he's speaking to us today, OK? <clears throat> I tell my students, the biggest mistake when we study history is that we see history as something out there, way beyond our reach. History has a long reach. It touches us now. And I think he reminds us of that. He is speaking to us now. He's saying the Mexican-Americans, you don't have to accept it. You don't have to believe it. But that's what he's saying. 
And it's a powerful argument. We have sacrificed so that you can make claims for equal rights on the basis of our sacrifice. And that's exactly what LULAC did. LULAC said a lot of things. LULAC said we deserve equal rights because the Constitution guarantees us that. <coughs> but they also made the contributions argument. We've contributed to the development of the economy and so forth and so on. But we've also contributed with our blood for this country. On that basis and on that basis alone, we deserve equal treatment. Okay? It's a powerful, it's a powerful book. <coughs> Uh, he says other things that are somewhat like variations of that argument. He says that Mexican Americans who serve who serve valiantly are are the true Americans, next to the segregationists who despise Mexicans at home. There's a lot of discrimination going on. And we saying those segregationists are an American. That's not the American way. The American way is what we're demonstrating. We're joining the military and we're making this ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, we are the true Americans. That's powerful. That's powerful political capital for LULAC and for anybody else who wants to use it. <laughs> he says something else. He said, you know, we're going to Europe to fight for justice and democracy. <clears throat> when I come back, I'm gonna, we're going to continue that same fight. There's no difference between that fight and our fight. If we think in terms of values and principles, the value of justice, the value of democracy is as important here as it was in France when we were fighting there. So he analogizes the war against totalitarianism in Europe and the fight against segregation, inequality, and discrimination here. He does other things. He's a man with a command of language. He's a great writer in Spanish, and he's able to just put together words in these really moving ways. <clears throat> he says, estamos forjando patria. We are forging the nation, and we are clear, full participants in the forging of this nation. He wasn't a flag-waving fellow. Not that I don't take anything away from people who flag, wave the flag. But he's putting substance behind his patriotism, pretty serious substance. He's not just proclaiming to be an American. He's making some strong statements. We're forging a nation, and the Mexican-Americans are involved in the front lines in the forging of a nation because we're reinforcing the values of justice and democracy. Okay. All right, I'll let him speak now. <clears throat> Take a drink. I wish I had more time, but I'll read as much as I can until time runs out. Uh, you deserve to hear from him and not me. So at the beginning of the book, this is my translation. <clears throat> I'll read some things. I wrote my personal diary as a near complete account of the lives of a special group of frontline soldiers who served among millions of others in the Allied Army and shared in the misfortunes and dangers of the Great War. I especially wanted the Mexican origin people to know and claim the deeds and suffering of the soldiers who defended the reputation and good name of La Raza on the honor testing battlefields of France. Later he says about the writing of the diary, my book does not pretend to be a work of art or a literary jewel, but it is a sincere and reliable account of my ideas based on what I saw, what I did, and what I felt during the 16 months when I answered my nation's call to duty. We're at peace now. Our country was once in danger, but it no longer faces the sinister and disquieting way, days, the difficult trials, the unimaginable anguish, and the terrifying uncertainty. 
My favorite time to work on the diary was the twilight hours, usually with the reliable help of the flickering light of a paraffin candle. He just said, this is not a literary figure, and then he writes with this literary flair. I wrote as the events unfolded, <clears throat> as the scenes that I observed were moving me. I wrote in the barracks where we enjoyed the gift of electrical light and at French billets, far from clear danger, but with an earshot of the constant artillery rumble from the horrendous front. I wrote in dugouts, our covered underground holes. Sometimes I simply wrote with the sky as my cover, sometimes blue, sometimes covered with thick clouds, yielding the unrelenting rain that often fell over France. Um, this is a, well, we learned to recognize the smell of fresh smoke from the powerful explosives paid the bitter price of the supreme sacrifice and saw at close range the destruction of modern war. We don't want more wars. We expect justice for the soldiers who felt to make this world better, and we hope that history gathers their names and tells of their deeds with accurate reckoning. Those of us who despaired alongside the thousands of unknown and forgotten heroes will also have the moral responsibility to proclaim their acts of bravery and to do something to remember and honor their acts of self-denial. We will have to work at this until we reach our final hour when we leap over our last bulwark. <clears throat> this is a, when he decided to volunteer, he was teaching at a school, like I said, outside of New Braunfels called uh, Leden, uh, Lettinger, I think it was. And so he writes a letter to his students, his Mexican-American students, and this is what he says. There's a great deal of respect that he as a teacher has for these kids. And there are all grades, first up to sixth, seventh grade. My dear students, this is definitely our last day of school. You will start your vacation once I have gathered the text that the government has supplied us. Rest and have fun. I hope you enjoy the long period that follows. You will be free of classes and the required study. <clears throat> I cannot say the same for me. I do not know what the future holds, but I can assure you that I will witness grand events, a thousand and one yet unknown sights, and I hope to return to tell you everything. Next Monday at 11 in the morning, I will become part of the militia that will defend our country. Until now, I have used pencil and pen to wage trying battles for the educational advancement of our people. You will soon hear that I'm holding a rifle in the very trenches of France and upholding our people's pride for the glory and honor of our flag. And he goes on. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting conversation he had with his, uh, this uh, older gentleman of German origin in New Braunfels. He's, he's already signed up. They're about ready to leave. And there's all these civilians that have come out to see him off. And um, one, a German fellow comes up to him, and they have this conversation. I've already stated that the, that the opinion many foreigners have of us is unfortunate and even misguided. I was waiting at a tavern for the lunch hour when an old German approached me and asked me in Spanish, why didn't you leave for Mexico? I wanted to instantly flatten him since I knew full well his intentions were not good and that he did not know whom he was addressing. I answered, I do not have a reason for going to Mexico. Many Mexicans have crossed into Mexico, he retorted. I continued, I find nothing special or strange that Mexicans should go to Mexico, their homeland. They could not be in a better place. But if by saying Mexican you mean us, the citizens of this country who are of Mexican origin and live as such, I, for one, can assure you most sincerely that we do not all think that way. Men from other races have also fallen short, but I want you to know that, unlike them, many of us have wanted to be men enough to disregard for a while or possibly forever all the abuse we rece receive daily from miserable whites who unfortunately are citizens of the great American nation. Again, I do not believe that all of this is good reason for me to disregard my responsibility as a man, 
the flag that calls us to defend the nation, the flag under which we have been born, became, we became men and, well, I, I read longer. Anyway, their affronts have wounded us deeply, but not to the point of blinding us and encouraging us to ignore what we should heed. We should heed the nation's calling. If we return determined to join the struggle for justice, we will wage it as before and with the same courage that we will show the despots of Europe. I lived, level all of this and probably more at the German who tried to put something over me. I spoke in English. I did not want to respond in Spanish. I did not care if he did not understand, but I wanted the many others who were listening to know what I had said. I do not remember my tone, but I did notice that he seemed disoriented. He did not speak again, or more precisely, I did not give him a chance to say anything. I am sure he regretted challenging me the way he did. I cannot say he was afraid because the Germans in New Braunfels do not fear Mexicans. The old German walked away, embarrassed, slipping through the crowd. Just as well, I did not need advice, especially from a German. Why did he not counsel his own, who clearly needed guidance at that time? Onlookers with big ears began to gather. Nothing had happened, just the German making full use of his farm Spanish, and a Tejano using the language of Shakespeare. <laughs> he has this very strong sense of uh, self-pride. <laughs> I'm going to read this real quick because I'm going to come back to, to this individual. He's in Travis. He works at headquarters because he knows English and Spanish. He's learning French. And so he's real valuable as a linguist. So they have him working there. <coughs> Today, Mr. Maximiliano Gonzalez of Martindale came looking for his two sons, Filomeno and Simon. He's an elderly man who claims to be 70 years of age. He's almost sightless. He is actually blind. This is where he, we can see that the fair law of the draft by public lottery, in quotation marks, has failed. It does not work as it was intended. He goes on to talk about how Mr. Gonzalez is asking that at least one of his sons be released from military duty so that they could take care of him because he's very ill. And they refuse him. They refuse him. And that gets uh, <coughs> signs very angry. And he also condemns, of course, the government for not being consistent and it's promise. <clears throat> uh, I'll come back to him and his son. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a really moving statement that he makes <clears throat> as he's being transported by train from San Antonio uh, to Boston. But when he passes um, New Braunfels and the little town where he taught, this is what he says. <clears throat> Uh, at sundown, we passed by Dittlinger, a quarry worked by many men of Marraza. This is where I taught or was in charge of their children's school for a year. That combination of work, camp, and community is another battlefield. I waged battles until I got the county to pay the teacher who taught our children. <clears throat> Those were the kinds of victories I sought in civilian life, opening the school door for the workers' children. Now that I wear the warrior's uniform, I hope to win other battles and bring justice to our people as we join in afflicted humanity that is calling for the sacrifice of conscious and free-thinking men. This is exactly where the idea to pick up my rifle occurred to me. I was moved by the bad treatment many members of my raza face in these places. And he continues with that. He sees again the fight at home like the battle against totalitarianism in Europe. Right before he, he, he and his fellow soldiers are about to go uh, to the front, to the, the actual front, he participates in two major offenses before the armistice. And so they're asked to write their last letters in the event that they don't make it back. And I'm gonna read a couple of them. <coughs> the one he writes to his wife is the most moving. This is my last letter to you, my dear wife. This moment had to arrive sooner or later. It is here. Cry for me. I can understand that it is, since we know, we, now, we know how much you care for me and are recalling the difficult and happy times in our lives. You're also concerned about my children growing up as orphans. While you wait for the calm that is to come, know that my sacrifice was necessary, and more than necessary, it was honorable. 
It was a thousand times honorable to have fallen for the inalienable rights of humankind and the future well-being of our children. You may think that they had everything with me there, but that is not the case. As long as a horrible and long-standing prejudice continues in Texas against our raza, our happiness will never be complete. Then uh, writes a letter to my raza. He writes a letter to his wife, to his children, to his father, to the government, but also to Mexican-American people. Do not forget that we have fallen fighting with the sole purpose of holding our good name high. Living without the rights of free men is not living. We are demonstrating once and for all that we are good enough to fight for the rights, those rights so that society extends them to us in the future. <clears throat> we will no longer be responsible if you do not educate your children after the war. Educate them until they are fully aware of their obligations and rights as good citizens. Do this so we can rest in peace. Our blood has joined the dust and ashes of all the warriors who have fallen on the holy ground of liberated France. I'm going to read uh, one more if I can find the passage. Well, oh, there's so, there's so much in here. I wish I could read a lot more. We're going to run out of time, but we can have a conversation. Uh, he writes a letter to... Um, the father of a fallen Mexican-American soldier. And he, he speaks in a very caring way, but in a very caring political way. You know, he doesn't mince his words, even when he's writing to the father of a fallen soldier. Uh, <clears throat> he has other great um, passages. Uh, let me read this. Simon Gonzalez, he's a son, one of those sons that the father was trying to get released from active duty. So he gets killed. Simon was a, so he, he wrote about fellow soldiers, and he felt, wrote about fellow soldiers in a really endearing way. They were brothers. They actually do become brothers, brothers and sisters now. Uh, and so he's very, very moved that Simon should have died. <clears throat> he has a lot to say about him. Simon was a good-natured person who always sported a, mile, a smile while resting between the battles. Everyone who fought alongside him can attest to this. Whenever Simon spotted me, he would call out, Signs, here goes Gonzalez. I usually responded with an encouraging word or with the truth, as in, forward, this will soon be over. On other occasions, I would say, don't back away from those Germans. He would respond, that will never happen. Look, I'm here because of the Germans from Moronde, Martindale. Anglo friends knew him. They would overlook his behavior and treat him fairly. The rest of the soldiers who did not understand Spanish would just listen. Simon always laughed when he saw a German fall or when he saw them run, because in this front, we have always fought them at close range. He would only curse when they killed one of his friends. Simon was like an enraged lion when he cursed the Germans. He would quiet down for a long while and then walk without saying a word. Our offensive continued in spite of the asphyxiating um, the gases and powerful shells raining on Villers. And then he, he describes the black pall of smoke, flashes of light, whizzing sounds of shrapnel, and half a man disappeared. Everything happened at once. An enormous shell tore off a hip, and shrapnel shredded a leg and ripped his body all the way to the right side of the heart. This is how the life of that humble laborer ended. He was unknown as a civilian and will probably be forgotten after such a glorious death. How many persons from Martindale who unjustly sent him to war must now envy his heroic death. I'll stop there. Let me, let me show, how can I show the, the other images? I've got, I have some images that, uh, <coughs> I have a lot of images. By the way, one of the things I didn't say is that when I finally decided that I was gonna uh, translate his, okay, translate his book, uh, 
I looked for his family members. I found his uh, daughters and, and two sons. And I interviewed him. And when I interviewed him, I realized that they had documents. They took out documents. Oh, here's Daddy's picture. Oh, here's a letter he wrote. And I realized very quickly that they had a massive record of materials that he had created. So I convinced him to deposit the materials in, um, at the University of Texas um, in the archives. Um, devoted to Mexican Americans, the Mexican American Library Program. His collection is there. If anybody wants to go and study his materials, it includes letters to him, by him, all the materials that he used for the book. Uh, he wrote, he published a lot of articles in La Prensa and other newspapers. <clears throat> he even has two other manuscripts that he wrote. One is autobiographical, and another one is. Uh, a manuscript, book link manuscript that he wrote after coming out of a coma while here in McAllen, by the way. He talked about the afterlife, what it was like. And he said, it's, it's, you have to make choices up there, too. <laughs> and they're hard choices. But anyway, this is a, I don't know if this is a, OK. This is a f photograph of the founding members of LULAC and Corpus Christi. and. Uh, <clears throat> He's in there somewhere. I can't find him right now. There he is. There he is. <coughs> this is his picture in all his glory, in all his indigenous glory, as you can see. Uh, he's very serious, self-respecting uh, young man. He was 29 years of age. That's his uh, military photograph taken at, at Camp Travis in 1917. And this is a copy of the book that he published in 33 with Artes Graficas, a publisher in San Antonio. And that's a battle scene. And these are some of the fellows who served with him, and he took pictures of him and included in the book. Florencio Eras from Alice, the fellow in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry. Sixto Flores from Alice. Felipe Garcia from Mission. Pablo Perez, San Diego. Fortino Trevino, his closest friend from Malice. By the way, I got to tell you something about Fortino. These fellows were so close. <laughs> they really loved each other. He was very close to signs as well as to uh, Alonso Perales. Remember Alonso Perales? Well, Alonso Perales, well, every year on the eve of Alonso Perales' birthday, he would take his entire family from Alice, Texas, drive up to San Antonio, serenade Alonso Perales on the eve of his birthday, and then spend the whole day with his family. He was a barber from Alice after the war. Ilio Guerra from Rio Grande City. There's a lot of guerras around. Well, this is one of them. Juan Salinas, Edinburgh. And these are, how did he publish the book? He didn't have much money, so what he did is he asked for advance payment. And most of the people that gave advance payment for, were activists in LULAC. So they paid him, about, I think, around 3 or $4, and so they got a book afterwards, and he was able to publish. I don't know how many he published. I, I'm sure there weren't over 1,000. I figure around five, 700. There's some members from McAllen who contributed. Severo Herrera, you recognize him? Edano? I think Gregorio Sainz, Godinez, Vela, Tickpin, the editor of El Diogenes, a newspaper, uh, Flavio Salazar, the editor of a newspaper titled Orientación, Yanez, Cruz Kelly, Victoriano, Victoriano or Victorino, Victorino Garcia. <coughs> and this is uh, the return of the 90th Division in San Antonio, Texas. Immediately after this, they go to the barracks and they're released from active duty and everybody goes home. And that's this picture. Any questions, comments? Anything else you'd like to know about? You do. You have a question? No? Anybody? Yes? For him? No, for, for some Mexican. Yes, uh, uh, Mexican nationals also serve, by the way. 
Mexican Americans and Mexican nationals. We know more about the Mexican nationals who served in World War II. There was over 15,000 of them, many of whom received silver stars and congressional medals of honor, by the way. And one of the motivations for joining the military is so that they can then uh, become naturalized, uh, achieve, uh, obtain citizenship. That was one of the motivations. We don't know to what extent that was a motivation. But that was one of them because they left letters saying, I'm joining so that when I come back, I can claim my citizenship, the U.S. citizenship. Hmm. But yeah, and he, he acknowledges in this diary some um, soldiers that are Mexican nationals born in Mexico. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> yes? What's that again? This is children. Uh, one one daughter uh, and no wait a minute. Uh, two sons and one daughter joined the military um, and served during World War II. The daughter served as a nurse and then in civilian life continued as a nurse. Um, her husband, who just passed away, was one of the principal leaders in the American GI Forum uh, in the fifties. So it, it's a family that remained politically active in their own different ways. <clears throat> one of the sons, the one that I got to know the best, uh, was very active in his church uh, in Austin, Texas. Yeah. One of the, uh, another daughter lived in West Laco, another in Rio Grande City, by the way. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> yes? A Native American. He had a story that was handed down in his family that he used, he included um, to underscore his indigenous origins. <clears throat> he says that, that it, during the conquest, when the Spaniards came into what is now Mexico City, uh, Indians scattered. His, his uh, people, he said, went to the coast. But, and then found that there was a lot of Spaniards there, so they went in another direction. They kept trying to avoid the Spaniards over generations, and they ended up finally here close to, um, what is the capital of Tamaulipas? Ciudad Victoria area. And then they moved into uh, La Sierra Madre and basically hid until finally sometime in the 1800s they migrated into into Mier and in Camargo. When he was a teacher during the Second World War, he was uh, he applied in, uh, to this program that took him to Mexico to study Spanish, uh, the Spanish language and Mexican history. They sent teachers so they could come and teach these things. And a historian spoke to them, and he asked the historian, "Look, this is my story; has been handed down in my family." And the historian, who I traced. Um, but he never published this. He says, it's true. You know, that, that did happen. A lot of Native Americans scattered, and many of them ended up in the north, and some became Mexicanized, and then crossed the border and became even Mexican American. And so I'm one of them, he says. I'm the descendant of those uh, Native Americans that were trying to escape uh, the Spaniards over generations. Anything else? <coughs> Yes? Huh? He was very religious. He was a Catholic. <laughs> very, very religious. Uh, <coughs> he belonged to a, uh, a Catholic society. I don't remember the name of it. <coughs> but um, he was very spiritual. And he was also a man of faith and a cat member of the Catholic Church. He would invoke God a lot in his letters and in sometimes in his articles. And uh, um, for him, uh, his faith produced a social gospel, sort of. In other words, the word of God was part of that moral argument for equal rights. This is what, I mean, Canales and Perales were also very devout. Perales was a Catholic, um, and Canales was a... Uh, 
I'm not sure, but he's a, he was a Protestant. But all of them were very uh, men of deep faith, and uh, and they used that faith, you know, the basic rule, you know, the golden uh, rule that you treat others as you ex expect them to treat you. That was the basis of their moral arguments for equal rights. Yeah, and <coughs> his uh, in his manuscript where he talks about dying, and then coming back. That that was part of his spirituality. I don't want to define that as so much representing his faith or membership in the Catholic religion, but more open to the, the spiritual world. But he, I make a distinction between very, being spiritual, being a having a faith in God and all that God represents, and and then expressing that through the Catholic Church. So yeah, he was a man of faith. Anything else? <coughs> what did you think of him? Yes? Well, <coughs> uh, I've already written two articles on him. <coughs> I'm, I'm putting them aside. Uh, I did want to do another little book on him, but uh, I haven't been able to get the money. What I want to do is uh, follow his footsteps and, um, and just see what what would come to mind. Um, you know, go to Alice, look for his place where he's born, for uh, Realitos. I've already been to Alice and visited a, a number of places. I've been to, um, to the New Braunfels, New Braunfels area where he lived. I've been to other places. But I want to follow his footsteps across the ocean and then into the front through the armistice and back. But you know, I don't know. Huh? He's buried at the uh, military cemetery in San Antonio. In San Antonio. Uh, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm working on a, tra I'm translating another, I promised myself I wouldn't translate anymore, but I've taken on another translation project. I'm translating two small volumes uh, titled for uh, Defensa de mi Raza by Alonso Perales. Alonso Perales was very prolific. All these people were very prolific. They always wrote. And he cared, did, for example, he would write articles in serial form, like on, on educational rights or on whatever, or marriage. Each one of those series is a book. Perales did at least like seven or 10 series in the newspapers. He was publishing an article just about every other day in La Prensa. And he also wrote books. Canales wrote books. Perales wrote books. And two of his books are in Defensa de mi Raza in 1936 and 1937. And then he also wrote another book in 1947, Are We Good Neighbors? Where he's kind of basically criticizing the US government for saying during the war, we're building, uh, we're good neighbors with Mexico, but you don't treat us the same, you don't treat us as good neighbors here in the US. So that's another really fine book. So that's the other thing I'm working on right now. I'm also, if you all are interested, I'm heading a project with the Texas Historical Association to generate more articles on Tejanos for the Handbook of Texas. The Handbook of Texas, if you haven't visited yet, you should. It's the most important encyclopedia online on Texas history. It's the most successful tech historical encyclopedia in the country. So we're trying to increase the number of articles on Mexican-Americans or Tejanos. Uh, so if any of you have any biographies you want to write or an article on an event or an organization, let me know. So I'm working on that too. Any more questions, comments? Well, Victor, I think. One more, Haki. Uh, I don't know. I think it was something, I think cardiac related. Uh, he was having heart problems at the end. I know that. About it. I've never seen the death certificate. But he's writing, uh, he and Perales are writing to each other. And he's telling Perales, I want to see a doctor. The, the heart isn't doing very well, and I'm very tired. And, you know, I think I'm reaching the end. He already felt it. But I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen his death certificate. Any, anybody else? <coughs> <coughs> yes. 
parents, very interesting, uh, his parents, uh, his, his father uh, married a woman who was, uh, whose family was, was coming on, wag on a wagon from San Antonio, going back to Mexico <coughs> in the 1880s. And they fell in love, and the family left the young woman <laughs> with the Sainz family, and he, she married uh, Crispin, José La Luz's father. Uh, she was a, a Canary Islander, by the way. It's very important. Canary Islanders are the people that are some of the, or some of the original settlers from Spain in the San Antonio area. They become Mexicanized. So she's part, she can trace her ancestry back all the way to the 1700s, okay, in San Antonio. Just like José La Luz Sainz can trace his ancestry back to the 1500s in what is now Mexico. Uh, José La Luz Sainz then marries a woman by the name of Esparza. Esparza is the granddaughter of one of the survivors of the Battle of the Alamo. Several, at least a couple of Mexican women are inside with their children. And of course, they're allowed to leave after the battle. Mm. They went and settled outside of Pleasanton, the Esparza family, and, uh, and they built a town, um, San Agustin. And so he married the, the, this young woman of Esparza fame who could claim her ancestry back to the 1700s in San Antonio. Uh, these people were not very far removed from these histories. The, they, they, they knew those histories. They knew the early history of Texas. They claimed it. They knew the early history of Mexico. They claimed it. I, I find that really extraordinary. You know, again, remember how I started saying that we in our times think of history as something way out there because we don't acknowledge our own links to the past. They did. If any one of you looks at your past, you'll find, obviously, that you have a long, long ancestry, that your family has a long reach to the past. It doesn't matter where you come from. Anybody else? Uh, he, he, he didn't complain. Uh, uh, when he complained about prejudice and discrimination, most often he was talking about back home. The relations that soldiers are building are, are very special relationships. Sometimes somebody will, you know, say something stupid. Uh, the one, but he didn't really dwell on that. That was not an issue for him. They got along very well. I don't know if you heard about... Uh, um, what is this, the foxhole democracy? <laughs> you know, a lot of people become very close to each other and very respectful because they need each other, okay? Democracy develops naturally in the foxholes where you depend on other people. He did complain about officers who were generally haughty and arrogant and in, in a couple of occasions denied him the opportunity to go to officer school. And he called that discrimination. But that was the only instance that, that I can remember. Most of, most of the time, he's criticizing discrimination is what is occurring in Texas. No, the <coughs> I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. You know, when you're in, in the military, you know, you, especially when you're at war, you develop very strong bonds with each other. And he did. His, some of his best friends were white. And he developed friendships also with Germans while in Germany after the armistice. Anybody else? Any other questions? <coughs> Are you talking about ancestry? <coughs> 